book, page 120 in the old church hymnal. 155 in the new book, 120 in the old book. Victory in Jesus. Thank God I got victory this morning. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. I heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me Amen. Get around my fellowship this morning.
Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Good to see everybody this morning. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm saved this morning. Amen. Amen. Glad I'm saved. Amen. Here we are again another Sunday morning with a crowd of visitors in here. Amen. Amen. Uh, already seeing fruits of our uh, day of visitation yesterday. Some of these grown-ups turned a bunch of our kids loose, took them out. We ordered a a thousand flyers for our vacation Bible school, and they just went and swept the community. I don't know where all they went, amen, but I know one thing. I come back, and the stack of flyers was way shorter than what it was when they left, amen. and so we're already seeing people that come in this morning. So we run up on some of you young people yesterday, so thank the Lord for that, amen. Thank the Lord, amen. Every, I thank God for our visitors because I tell people all the time, all of us were visitors at one time or another. That's right. Visitors is what builds the church. Amen. So, uh, amen. Good to have you this morning. Good to have you. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Remember the ones that you don't see. Remember Miss Nancy and Miss Wanda that are uh, dealing with a death and some sickness in their family. Uh, remember Dawson. He's going to be going to the doctor later on this week. Brother Cecil. Remember, remember my granddaughter, Cecil. Remember amen. Amen. Remember Brother Cecil's granddaughter. Amen. Good to see Brother Cecil and Miss Joyce with us. Amen. amen. I'm not mistaken, Brother Cecil's our oldest member. Are you 94 yet, Brother Cecil? Yes, sir. 94 years old. Amen. Been a blessing to me all the years that I've known him. Amen. So good to have him and Miss Joyce. They're still, still driving their selves to church at 94 years old. Amen. And if you got any little ailments, amen, that's hindering you, you know, Brother Danny preached the other day, who or what hath hindered you, yeah. you might want to sit down and have a, a uh, little shade tree talk with Brother Cecil every once in a while, amen. It'll be an encouragement to you amen. to push through your ailments and come on to church. Yeah. Man could, has numerous operations on his face, removing cancer and, and dealing with things and just growing old. He could go on and on yeah. and still finds himself sitting in the house of God when the doors are open. Amen. Brother, that's a blessing. Amen. That is a blessing. Mama? That's our little cousin, Junior. Amen. Remember that. Amen. Amen. Beth Freeman. Remember her. Amen. Anybody else? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Remember. Amen. Amen. Remember Mr. Ricky. Amen. Amen. Remember, we got... Yeah, Evan's got to go back up north, amen. When you leaving, Evan? Tomorrow morning, amen. Pray for him, pray for his mama as he leaves again. It's like he's, it's like he's on furlough from the military, <laughs> amen. He's got to go back, amen. Lord lets us live. We have to grow up, get a job and work, amen. Mamas don't like that when it comes to mama's boys, yeah. amen, so. Good to see y'all, amen. Good to be in church. Yeah. Amen. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I do remember uh, my cousin Adam Grooms, it's also Mr. Sonny's grandson. He was in a in a ATV accident last week, and, and the Lord spared him. Amen. amen. The Lord spared him. So we're thankful for that. Been talking to him a little bit. Amen. So remember him this morning. Amen. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Brother Stephen, pray for us. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God, for loving us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Amen. We're going to, we're getting ready to sing another song. Uh, we do have a children's church. Amen. Uh, our children's church is from ages 4 to 11. Um, we'll dismiss. We get done uh, singing another song. We'll, uh, we'll dismiss right out this door. If you got kids ages 4 to 11, they'll be in good hands. They'll only be about 30 foot from us right back here in our fellowship hall. Uh, but we'll have, uh, have them in there, and they'll, uh, they'll get spoiled by whoever's doing children's church. They'll get a lesson from the Bible, amen, and, uh, and get some churching in there while their mamas and daddies are uh, getting churching in here. So, amen, we'll dismiss in just a minute uh, for our children's church. Brother Rusty, you go ahead and come on here and get us another song. Amen. Let's get our song books again. Turn to page 27. <clears throat> page 27. It's only in the new book. Y'all got to liven up some this morning. Yeah. Come on. Thank God I got a mansion this morning. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Sing it. I'm satisfied. Tammy and Miss Mariah is going to be handling that. Be right out uh, those foyer doors right there, sanctuary doors, first row, uh, first row to the right. Amen. <laughs> first door to the right. <clears throat> Amen. It's good to have you here. Amen. Good to have you here this morning. <clears throat> uh, I am attempting this morning, man. I have I have battled. 
dealing and preaching what I'm going to deal with this morning all week. Uh, I, I even, all the way, to, I mean, I woke up this morning stressing about it uh, on my mind. Um, and I'm going to tell you what the devil don't like. The devil don't like truth. Amen. He don't like truth. And uh, we ought to know that by now. That's the reason why we have a, such a hard time trying to be faithful to the things of God and uh, being sold out to the Lord and being around the things of God. Because, listen, the, the Bible never said if you live in the world you're going to suffer persecution. The Bible says they who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you just go, all, all you've got to do to start getting attacked by the devil is just have a made up mind. You only got to come to church for the first time. You just change your mind at home and say, you know what, honey, we're going to start going to church. We're going to live for God. We're going we're gonna to do things different, and the attack is on, brother. It'll probably happen right there in your living room before you ever get them words out of your mouth. And that's just how it is. You Listen, that's the reason why Paul said to war a good warfare. Endure hardness as a good soldier. So we ought to be used to things like that. But uh, by the grace of God, I'm going I'm I'm to do a series of messages, and I battled whether to do this on a Sunday morning, and I said, bless God, people that set Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, what's the difference, amen? We need to hear the truth. We need to hear this stuff, and, uh, and so I made my mind up, and got peace about it, struggled with it, but got peace and the, and the green light to, to preach it this morning, and so uh, we're going to preach, amen? We're going to talk about some things, uh, but uh, this is probably going to be one of two or three messages in a series, maybe over the next two, three Sundays uh, that we'll do. But find your place in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses uh, 1. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1. Uh, Thessalonians, be back in your T's. Good way to keep up with where Thessalonians is. The first book of your T's, your New Testament, past uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, you have Thessalonians. Now, you hang around uh, here much, you'll realize that we're uh, a little old-fashioned. We're a little old-fashioned, and uh, there's nothing wrong with being old-fashioned. Amen. Amen. If you missed Sunday school this morning, y'all young mamas and daddies, I wish we'd have recorded it. Not because Stephen taught it, amen. amen. And we, I'm not, I'm not, we're not recording this morning because Ronnie Wayne's preaching. People just need to hear the truth. Uh, and I'm telling you, tremendous Sunday school lesson this morning on raising kids and what daddies and men ought to be doing with our boys and what parents ought to be doing with their kids. And it's, hey, that's from conduct from our home to how we're rearing them up in church and sitting on the pew with them and even teaching them to be manly and being womanlike. Man, it's a good message. A good message this morning. Uh, but in 2 Thessalonians 2, you know what makes us old fashioned? It's the book that we use. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's this old black back King James Bible. Amen. And people say it's archaic and it's hard to understand, but it's the truth. Amen. And, and I guess if you use something old-fashioned, then you become old-fashioned. Amen. Right. Uh, but I believe God's old-fashioned. I don't believe God's hip and hop with this modern world that we're living yeah. in. Amen. Yeah. Uh, listen, we don't, we don't change with the world. We try to stay with the book. And there's a way to serve God and have fun. Brother, you hang around here about a month. You'll see we can have some fun and, oh, yeah. and get wore out and travel and get to see the world and, and yeah, you might get in a fight or two, amen. You hang around long enough, somebody might cuss somebody out around here. But that don't mean we don't know the truth. <laughs> we, we, try to, we try to stick with the book, amen. Right. And so nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, look in verses 1. It's good to have our visitors. Got some friends from Wadesboro over here. I'm terrible with names, so they're our friends right now uh, from Wadesboro. Good to have my cousin Scott and his wife back there. Have some more people uh, that's come in. Amen. Good to have them. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren. Now he's talking to Saved people. And let me go ahead and say this. This message is really to saved people. We've got a world, people that's lost, people that's never been saved. Good. Some, there, let me say, there's people in our community 
that have never been saved that are better than most Christians that I know. If goodness and being good to your neighbor and being a friend to the preacher would get you to heaven, we got a pile of them. We probably got better or more good people in our town than we do good Christians. Can I say that? Can I say that? But we've got a world out here that has watched over the last, if you, if you got any age on you, if you're 30, 40, 50 years old, we've got a, a world, a society that is, is sitting back with their popcorn and they're watching the church scene and their head spinning. They say, saying, these people say this and they act like this and they members of this church. And then we got this crowd over here and they say and they act and we see them in these places and they talk like this when we see them on the job. And, they, and then we got this crowd over here and they believe and say and dress and do like this. And the world don't even know. They don't, they're, they're head spinning. They don't even know what to think about church. Right. Amen? Amen? And so the message is to Christians to warn us. I'm not trying to get on anybody this morning. We're going we're gonna to see some, I think, some good stuff. It's, it's a warning. It's a sound of, a, of an alarm to the church. But it's to... It's to also inform the world, anybody that's lost that's looking at us, that, hey, we, we realize what's going on. Yeah. We're not trying to be carried away with every wind of doctrine and, and everything that's going on in every church around the world. There is a right way. Amen. And, 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 this, and, and we're trying to let the world know that, hey, we want to be solid in this book. Amen. We want to be found uh, right with the Lord. There is a right way. Things that are different are not the same. All right, things are different and not the same. But the world, they'll stereotype the whole Christian as just a big melting pot of, of ignorance. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his return is imminent. He's coming. But that day will not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. So what's going to happen before the Lord comes? Before the day that the Lord steps out on the clouds and, and gets his bride, which is me and you. We make up the bride of Christ if you're saved. What's going to happen before, before that day, a great falling away is going to take place. We're going to be raptured out of here. The tribulation will start. People that are left here have to endure the seven-year tribulation the Antichrist will come on the scene during that seven years. But before the rapture of the church, the Bible says a falling away is going to take place. Look at 1 Timothy 4, very next book. 1 Timothy 4. This, this message, while you're turning, this message is, is going to be more informative than anything else. Trying to educate us uh, with the information we're going to deal with this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verses 1. Now the Spirit, that's capital S, Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. I mean that word right there means in your face. He's wanting you to listen. He's right in front of you. He, it's an emergency. It's, it's a warning. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. From the faith. Now that's, that's being born again. That's being part of the church and part of doing right and part of uh, living for God. Some shall depart from that. Yeah. Giving heed to seducing spirits. That's a spirit that gets you and you don't even know it got you. Yeah. You take a kid, a white van comes by, everybody's scared of white vans. The white van comes by and somebody done something to seduce that child. child didn't even know it was being seduced. It didn't know it was getting into danger. In the last days, the Bible said the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something. Yep. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed. That means you, your resistance broke down. Yep. And some spirit got a hold of you, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yep. Doctrines, that's teachings yep. of devils. If you'd have knew what was going on, you wouldn't have been seduced. You wouldn't have been deceived. Amen? Yeah. Look at verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. All right? Turn to 2 Timothy 
4. Two more, two more uh, places right here we're going to read and then we'll get into it. I need you to hear this right here. It's going to come a falling away first. Some shall depart from the faith. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 1. You got it? 2 Timothy 4, verses 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. People don't like that, amen. That's what the preacher is commanded to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Look at verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. One more verse. Look at 2 Timothy 3 verses 8. Back up just a little bit right there. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. You see that? Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now when I seen that verse, that kind of stuck out to me. That word reprobate, boy, that's like, that's like uh, blaspheming the Holy Ghost, if you will. I mean, when you hear that, you're like, man, that's no hope. But he says reprobate concerning the faith. That, that word reprobate means to be abandoned. Yeah. It's, like, it's like being in trouble at sea. Uh, we give this illustration, and you're in trouble, and somebody throws you the lifeline, and you resist the truth. You resist help. You don't want to hear it. That's God in the lifeboat. He's throwing you the lifeline. And you resist, and you rip. And finally, you know what God does? God said he done made his mind up. Yeah. I'll turn him over to a reprobate mind. God didn't give you a reprobate mind. He didn't form a reprobate mind in people like this. He just turned them over to it. You want to live like that? You want to think like that? God let, and you know what God does? God pulls off with the lifeline in tow. And you're abandoned out there. Amen? And so this person, these people, they're, they're reprobate, they're abandoned when it comes to the faith. The Bible says over there in the same scripture that they're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in these verses that we read, these four different places, I see falling away in 2 Thessalonians. I see in 1 Timothy 4, depart from the faith. 2 Timothy 4, turn away from the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, resist the truth. Reprobate concerning the flesh. You know what the common thread is in those verses right there? A departing from or a falling away. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with a falling away in these last days. A falling away. We're warned in scripture of this in these last days. There's an English word that we use as Christians to describe this. It's just like trinity or rapture. Those words are not found in your King James Bible, but we use them because the principle and the truth of those words are there. The rapture will take place one day. We are going to be called away. God's going to step out on the cloud and say, come up hither. The Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, it's all throughout our Bible. It's a Bible truth. But the word's not actually in there. The English word to describe what is going on in these last days is apostasy. Apostasy. Here's what this word means. It means defection, depart, and abandonment of what one has professed. A total desertion. In other words, they've deserted the faith. Departure from one's faith or religion. In 2 Timothy 3 verses 5, right there about three verses up, here's what the Bible says about them. These people, these apostates, these people that have fallen away, the Bible says that they have a form of godliness. Now I want you to pay attention. You've got to keep up with me. I'm going to give you some information that's going to help you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, these apostates have a form of godliness. What do you mean, preacher? In other words, they have a talk game. They're religious. They have a church that they go to. 
Matter of fact, a lot of apostates make up that kind of church. They have youth groups. They have singing groups. But the problem is, they're apostates. They have deserted. They have fallen away from the faith, the truth of the Bible. Everybody okay? Everybody all right? So this is, this is what our series of messages is going to be on. I entitled this, How to Identify an Apostate Church. How to Identify an Apostate Church. Now, we're living in a time where people will accept anything. We're living in a time where, uh, you know, it don't matter if you go to South Ridge or if you go down there, you go in, just as long as you're going somewhere. And the majority of the world does not know anything about the difference. They think because it's got a steeple on it, and they say Jesus every now and again, and they got youth groups posted online and on their Facebook, and, and they've had Bible studies. They, 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 it's, just, it's the same thing as anywhere else. And nobody, nobody's willing to get their head out of the sand and, figure, and teach and stand and cry out and spare not and point out the differences. There is differences. Listen, you, we don't serve God and come up with our own organizations just however we want to and God be pleased with it. It's got to be in the book. It's got to be aligned with the book. And so I want to preach to you or try to help you on how to identify. Now listen, they're not going to come. They got to form a godliness. They got, they're not going to come out and say, hey, uh, our church is apostate. We have fallen away from the faith. And there's a lot of things in the Bible we don't mess with. And there's a lot of the world that we've brought into the church. They're never going to, they're never going to witness to you like that. And so you know what we have to do? You say, preacher, you're pointing fingers. You better believe I'm pointing fingers. And if God wouldn't have held the reins on me, and it might happen anyway, you might hear about some of your friends. Amen? Amen. Listen, if, if you don't know the difference, then somebody, Somebody has to help you identify where these people are, what they're tied up in. Everybody all right? Amen. How to identify an an apostate church. So number one, I'm just going to do one thing today, and I'm going to try to unload it on you. Listen, just hold your horses. Put your seatbelt on. One thing today and then we'll deal with something else next Sunday. How to identify an apostate church. Number one. Number one, you ready? You can identify an apostate church by their music. You can identify, listen, I'm not here to get on people that listen to secular music. Listen, if, if you're not saved, that's what, that's, we, listen, if you are saved and you listen to, I'm not here to get on you for listening to your music. I'll give a saved person a piece of advice. And the reason why I can is because I've been there. I've come up, I've had to, I've had to grow through some certain things, and I'm still growing, amen. I'll tell you what, for a boy to try to live uh, with, a, with, a, with a, young, a young couple and a young family, to try to live for God and stay on fire for God, I'll tell you one thing that hindered me, early part of my Christianity, and it was the type of music I listened to. Amen. And if you ever want to go another step for the Lord, you, you, you already know what I'm talking about. If you've lived for God, especially young people, young adults, you, some old people probably, if you've ever lived, tried to live for God, man, you get on fire and you're doing things, and there's a couple things that haunt you. I, got, I was sitting there in Sunday or earlier thinking about five or six things that you could use in a, as an outline that are big stepping stones in your Christian walk. There's something the devil knows what to use. He knows what our weaknesses are. Most everybody in here, our weakness is music. I struggled for 10, 12, 14 years of my early Christian life with music. Were you dying and going to hell for listening to your music? Oh, I wasn't dying and going to hell. But I'll tell you what, it's hard to think about God and the Bible and being a soul winner and living for God and praying and, and, and abstaining from all these other types of things that a Christian ought not to do and listen to it get pumped in your ear all day. Amen. It does something to you. And so just a piece of advice for Christians, if you ever want to get mature as a Christian, You'll learn to lay that stuff down. You'll learn to lay, it's a hinder. It's like Paul said, laying aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. I know y'all didn't come here for this today, but I did. Amen. Listen, 
Paul said, laying aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. Yeah. You know what? We have things in our life, and every one of us could get better. Every one of us got things we could lay down. Even at, as old as I am, as long as I, there's things in my life that still hinder me if I let them. Yeah. And you know what I need to do? I need to learn to lay them down. He said, laying aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. It's like having a shackle tied to you. Or, or a big weight belt tied around you trying to run a marathon, brother. Hey, listen, people are passing you. There's people got saved at the same time as me. They're 20 years ahead of me because I tried to run with weights tied around my ankles. Yeah. And it took me 10 years to realize some of those things to take the weights off. Amen. So you can sprint a little bit and stride a little bit and do something for God. Man, I should have been here where I'm at 15 years ago in my Christian walk. Yeah. Amen? Amen? That's just a piece of advice for you. But I'm dealing with apostate churches. Amen. I'm not dealing with getting on people's music. Look, look, that's between you and the Lord. Amen? Between you and the Lord, I, I just know what will help you. It's like taking good vitamins or, or, or eating right, amen. I know what will help you in your Christian walk. Right. Listen, their music. How do you spot an apostate church? How can you identify their music? The Bible says in Ephesians 5, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Over there when the Lord and them sat down after the Last Supper, they sat down, the Bible says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. God believed in singing hymns. Now, I didn't say you couldn't sing outside. The reason why we like the hymns is because they, they're biblical. Yeah. Amen? They're biblical. The Lord sang hymns. It's just poems about the Lord, exalting the Lord. Nothing about self. Not a bunch of attention brought to some superstar on the stage. It's all worship and praise about the Lord. Right. Amen? Amen. Listen. Contemporary Christian music surfaced. We're talking about contemporary, y'all hear me say all the time, I remember 20, 30 years ago when it started getting on the scene in Richmond County. Well, it's, it happened before then. That's when I remember it getting into our county. Amen? Contemporary Christian music surfaced as a result of the 1960s and 70s. You good? As the 1960s and 70s Jesus movement. How many of y'all Y'all seen a lot of that, and I'm going to probably offend somebody right here with Asbury and the Jesus Revelation, Revolution, whatever it is. Yeah, that's right. You told me about it, didn't you? Amen. Listen, contemporary, see, I done lost some of y'all. I'm talking about contemporary. I'm trying to warn you. You can buy all the contemporary music CDs you want, and you can eat them for lunch if you want to. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to help you identify an apostate church. Listen, one of, the, one of the best ways to identify them is their music. This contemporary Christian music surfaced out of the 60s and the 70s, out of the Jesus movement or the Jesus movement revival, and then the music was originally called Jesus music. Some of y'all people that's 100 in here know exactly what I'm talking about because y'all was teenagers back then. Amen, that was a joke, laugh. Listen, many young people from the 60s, counterculture, profess to believe in Jesus. Here was the problem. Here's the problem. I'm telling you, the devil don't like this, y'all. He does not like what I'm talking about. That's why I've been laid up all night stressing with pressure on my mind and in my spirit about this. Because the devil has, he has got his way, brother. He has come down through there and he just threw a cloak over churches. And, he's, and people just letting him run rampant yeah. how he wants to. And nobody is pointing him out. Right. So many young people from the 60s counterculture profess to believe in Jesus. The problem is, here's what they brought with them. Here's what they brought with them. They brought free love. Getting in touch with nature. You listen to me? Homosexuality. Smoking dope. Tripping on shrooms and LSD. Nudist colonies. And the rest of it was all part of the Jesus Revolution. And contemporary music was birthed out of it. In other words, and we listen, we still got these drug addicted sodomites in Rockingham. People that come out of that movement, you know what they want? They want their Jesus and their lifestyle too. Yep. 
That is not biblical. You say, preacher, you're being judgmental. No, I'm being by the book. That is not religion. It's their religion, but it ain't the Jesus that we worship. Jesus is not part of the Jesus revolution. He's not part of free love. He's not part of smoking your weed and drinking your stuff and, 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 and having orgies and being homosexual. And all. Hey, God will save anybody. Anybody that's repentant and wants to be born again, God will save their soul, brother. But you're not going to bring that in and be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have a repentant heart toward your sinful lifestyle. And God will forgive you and put you right in there. And see, the problem with this is they brought that free love movement and all that with it and outbirthed contemporary music. Well, what made contemporary music? Well, they wanted to take the world's beat. Woodstock, 50s, 60s, tripping on everything they was tripping, brother, they was tapping into another world. Yeah. Another world. Some of y'all, some of y'all been on a trip, may never come back. <laughs> hey, listen. And it was birthed. And you know what they did? They put the world's beat with music. Yeah. I need y'all to, to stay with me a few minutes. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Listen, a modern beat. They put the world's beat in God's music. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22 verses 26, they have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. It's a modern beat with sensual rhythms. What's that word sensual mean? That's a Bible word. That means pertaining to the flesh or body in opposition to the spirit, not spiritual or holy, but evil. Yep. The Bible says these be they that are sensual having not the spirit. Right. Talking about the Holy Spirit. The chief component, now I'm going to give you some education. I had to learn this just in the last few days. So we're learning together, but I'm telling you, God showed me some things in this. The chief component in modern worldly music and contemporary music is what musicians in the world call the heavy backbeat. The heavy backbeat or the anapestic beat versus what we sing old-fashioned hymnals are saying with a marching beat. Yep. Hut, two, three. If you're in the battle for the Lord and ride. Hut, two, three, four. You get it? Yeah. Verses. Get that? Right. That done something to you. I seen a couple of them back there wanting to get up. And <laughs> Listen. The devil ain't retarded, and musicians are not retarded. I'm going to read you some things. The heavy backbeat, this world, this sensual beat that the world brought into the Jesus scene, it's like the Catholic Church and the Reformation. The Reformation brought a lot of people and denominations out, but they held on to a lot of their, their, their mother church, the Catholic. A lot of these, these Protestant churches, still, they like first cousins to them. They still got a lot of things that they do that the Catholic church done. And coming out of this movement, you know what stuck with our society? Contemporary music. Yep. And it's the world's beat. Listen, the anapestic measure emphasizes the offbeat. And then we just seen... Uh, the difference in a marching beat, which is what we sing our hymns with. This beat is included in most or all Christian rock, Christian pop, and Christian rap music. Remember, let me read you some quotes from the music industry. This is what musicians and rockers and pop stars said their self. Here's a quote. They describe their music as sexy. Sex lies in the heavy backbeat, one said. Some of y'all that's a hundred in here is going to know some of these names. These, these are some of the original people out of the 60s and 70s. Erwin Sibler said, the great strength of rock and roll lies in its beat. Deborah Harry of Blonde 
said the main ingredient in rock and roll are sex and sass. Jan Berry of Jan and Dean says the throbbing beat of rock, I'm getting somewhere with y'all. The throbbing beat of rock provides a vital sexual release for adolescent audiences. Chris Stein, he says, everyone takes for granted that rock and roll is synonymous with sex. Here's some of y'all's favorite rapper Luke Campbell of Two Live Crew. The sex is definitely in the music and in all aspects of the music. Not the word, y'all. Yeah. The music. Yeah. I'll preach us the same words. We're talking about music here. Music affects your spirit. Remember when David was in there, Saul had a wicked spirit, evil spirit come to him, and, and, and David went in there and played the heart. He didn't sing. He played the music and the right kind of music of getting the bad spirits out of here. Yeah. That's the reason why you want to have good, pure, godly music in your church. It'll run the evil spirit. Like, why do people have singing before they ever start church? It's to get the people prepared, get the sanctuary prepared for worship. Right. Amen? Rocker Tom McSloy says, listen at this, rock is visceral. That means it moves you on the inside. It does disturbing things to your body. Talking about that beat, y'all. That beat. Paul Stanley said, rock is based on one's lower nature. Everybody knows what that means. John Oates of Hall and Oates said, rock is 99% sex. Dr. Dave Elkine, chairman of the Department of Child Study at Tufts University, said, there's a great deal of powerful, albeit subliminal, that means it's working on your subconscious. When you listen to music, and I'll go all the way from rap to pop, all the way to contemporary Christian music. We're talking about the beat and the rhythm. Yeah. It affects you subconsciously. You know that doctors, nerve doctors, brain doctors, mental doctors, psychiatrists, they use, they use music to treat patients. Why? Because they can change their way of thinking subliminal, yeah. subconsciously. He said there's a great deal of powerful, albeit subliminal, sexual stimulation in the music's rhythm, and you don't even realize it. And so I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, preacher, phew, I'm good because I don't listen to Christian rock, Christian rap, Christian pop. I'm more into Lauren Daigle. Amen? Listen, let me name some of your favorites. Lauren Daigle. Bethel Worship, Hillsong, Jen Johnson, Brandon Lake, Elevation Worship. Let's get closer to home. Crowder, Dante Bow, King and Country, Toby Mack, Big Daddy Weave, K Love, Easy Listening. So preacher, you don't have that. They don't have that big heavy backbeat. Well, I've been trying, I've been trying for a long time, y'all. I've been trying to make the connection between the way some of this easy listening, love type, sensual, contemporary music. I've been trying to make the connection with that and how it makes us feel. And I believe we own to something. We own to something. Listen, when you, when you tune it, the, the universal standard, some of y'all may know this, some of you may not. When you tune an instrument, a piano, it's got strings, or a guitar, the universal standard for tuning is four, 440 hertz. Now, 440 hertz means that when you hit that guitar string, every second, that thing vibrates 440 times. They say when you're sitting down not doing anything, your body vibrates at seven vibrations per second. You're at rest. If you study vibrations, different levels of vibrations do different things to your body. I told you music's alive. Yep. It does something to you. It speaks to you. 
You remember, remember we talked about the Lord, we talked about uh, creating Lucifer, and the Bible says that he was created with pipes and tablets in him. Those were organic instruments. They were alive, brother. They were alive. That wasn't a muffler pipe sticking out of Lucifer. He was created with pipes and tablets in him. And brother, music is alive and it speaks to you. It does something to you. So the standard universal tuning frequency is 440 hertz. You can go through all your love songs. All your love songs from all your classic rockers to your Guns and Roses to all your easy listening. And what's that lady that talks to y'all late at night all night long? And uh, What's her name? You know her, Rusty. What's, y'all know who I'm talking about. Somebody tell me. They ain't scared. Delilah, my wife. God help. Her name even sounds deceptive. All that. You know what it does? It, it does something. You know what? Every bit of that music, every bit of that music, and every bit of the easy listening that goes right along with Toby Mac, it goes right along with Lauren Daigle, it goes right along with the whole Elevation Worship, Bethel music, and uh, 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 uh. See how that makes you feel? Yeah. You, want, you want to go back to Woodstock, free love, hug a tree, yeah. rub some stones together. The tuning frequency that all that music's played at, y'all look at me like I'm a fool if you want to, but I'm looking a little deeper than the surface. It's tuned at 432, which might not make a big deal to you, but every one of them are tuned there. And, and that chord, that 432 hertz per second, that chord, I'm just reading, I'm reading uh, testimonies from musicians and secular artists. That chord is referred to in the world as the God chord. Let me read some nicknames for that chord. That is, that's that, y'all know what I'm talking about, that easy, that, that Bethel worship type stuff happened. You know, it's just, oh God, let's all come together. Sweet Jesus, Holy Mary, and all that stuff. Yeah. Does something to you. It, it is doing something to you. It's called the God chord. It's called the miracle music. Sacred tuning. Love and healing. Listen at this one. To a lot of musicians, it's the flat earth theory for musicians. In harmony with planet earth is where this frequency puts you at. In sync with the universe. It has the same spirit as the meditators, tree huggers, yoga enthusiasts. Let's do, you do yoga with your grandma, I don't care. I'm trying to tell you. Some quack that sits around looking like this for 30 minutes, he's got issues. Good Lord, man, there's work to be done. I can get you to meditate. Listen, the same spirit as the meditators, the tree huggers, the stone rubbers, and the save the planet crowd is the same spirit that this music has. Listen at this quote. Listening to the 432 hertz frequency resonates inside your body it releases blockages and expands our consciousness it allows us to tune into the wisdom of the universe divine intelligence and even with our own soul it creates unity instead of separation now I'm probably going to offend somebody right here but this is not intentional listen God is a separatist I'm not telling you there is independent Baptist churches that are off their rockers. I would, I would not tell you to go to an independent Baptist church. There are, some, there are some Southern Baptist churches that I would refer to you before I would some independent Baptist churches. And on and on and on down the road. I'm not trying to point out anybody. But I'm telling you there's an ecumenical movement that the Bible talks against. It's a coming together. In the tribulation period it's known as that great horde that sitteth on the hill. A one world religion that's going to come. And it's already formed. The Bible says that the, the spirit of iniquity doth already work. Yeah. We're coming together already. You know, what this, you know what this music does? And you look at me and say, Preacher, why wouldn't you support unity? I, we do. Our church needs to be united. But we can't unite with the world. We can't come together with things that are not of this book. You know what coming together does? 
You know, here's how, here's how the world, here's how this music will make you do. You'll come together, but you got to lay down your Bible differences. you got to throw away the doctrines of the Bible to be able to come together, and you cannot do that. God esteems his word above his own name. And one day when we stand at the judgment, there's going to be a book there, and then there's going to be some books there. And you know what God's going to have? He's going to have this book right there. And we're going to give an account to God for what this book says. And so wherever you go to church, it better be lined up with that. The Bible says where much is given, much is required. Say, preacher, I don't want to hear that. Well, that's why I'm getting you while you're here, amen. 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 You done put your offering in the plate and you ain't getting it back. Amen. amen. We'll haul these youngins to the berry patch, eat ice cream with what you put in the offering plate. And listen to some good godly music. Ha. Amen. <laughs> amen. Listen. It creates unity instead of separation. Worship music, worldly, contemporary worship music is transdenominational. Not transvestite, they some of them too. Transdenominational. In other words, it fits all denominations. You can take Catholics, you can take Mormons, you can take Muslims, you can take Baptists. You go to a lot, of your, a lot of your big gigs now. I'm telling you, you better watch out. Some of these, some of these youth, youth things going on, some of these big camps going on, and everybody, oh, we had, we had 2,000, we had 8,000 in there. You know what? That's because that music's transdenominational. And you know what you've done? You've laid down the book to go unite with people. Amen. And you're going to give an account to God one day for that. Amen. Amen. It's transdenominational. It bridges any denomination. Listen, here's another quote. The listener will begin to resist separation. I've seen this happen in Bible-believing churches. People listen to contemporary Christian music. And they listen to it for a few years. And, and they end just like the, the most faithful people in the church. Hey, listen. Amen the Bible. Amen the preacher. You can't preach it hard enough. If it's out of that Bible, bless God, we just need to get our life straightened up with the Bible. That's, that's, that's the mindset of people that believe the book. Yeah. But you begin to listen to that music. I've been trying to find the connection, y'all. You begin to listen to that music, and it breaks down your resistance of separation. And then, I'm not trying to point fingers at your cousin, your buddy, your grandma, or your buddies across the road, but then you are willing. Subconsciously, this thing has worked on you, and you're willing to lay down the standards of that book, and the light that God showed you in that book, and hook up with anything else, let's just all come together. Amen. It'll break your resistance. That's what this music does. That's what it does. And I've seen people leave Bible-believing churches. Some of them go to other churches, but some, most of them not even in a church. You know what they were? They were deceived. You know why? Their mindset changed. The preacher's too judgmental. Well, they need to be, they need to let them have, let them kids have a little more freedom or, or da, 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 you know, it's on and on and on. Their resistance has broke down. At one time when they were separated from the things of God and worldliness and this whole world system, world, they broke down. Yeah. It's kind of like what love songs do to a, a 16-year-old girl in the backseat of a car if some moron lets her go with some boy. Yeah. Amen. You let him talk enough and let him play the right popular soothing 432 music yeah. actually that's that that's the same tune that love music is played in too yeah. and it stimulates and that's the reason why her resistance got broke down in the backseat of the car because that type of music breaks your resistance see what they done they brought the world's beat yeah. on the Jesus scene and people wasn't they wasn't bright enough to pick up on what's going on and that's just sweating. Pray to, why, why is everybody hating against that? Like they singing about, you know, and so there, here we are. So now somebody like, like me looks like the fool. I look like the fool because I'm saying stuff like this. No, here we are. We've got, a, we've got a generation or two already that's just been born into this stuff and it looks normal. Somebody needs to pull back the curtain and show you what it's supposed to be. Amen. They have put no difference. The walls of separation are coming down. They put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 12, you can listen to the Lord or you can say, I'm, I'm going with the Jesus revolution. He says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. The Lord's a separateness. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. Music is a telltale sign that a church is apostate or either they're headed that way. There's a lot of churches, give them the benefit of the doubt. There's a lot of people. I've been guilty of getting too close to some music. There's a lot of churches, and I'm talking about in the church. You know what the right thing to do is when you realize that you're getting too close, back out of it. There's a lot of churches that's just, try, they, they, in, in all honesty and purity of their heart, they're worshiping God. And they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. They're not purposely going against what God has done. But somebody needs to tell them. Somebody needs to tell them. We can't worship God on our own terms. When the stand of music or the standard of music is lowered, you've heard us say all the time, most good churches end up, the music's the first thing goes. And when the standard on music is lowered, then there goes everything else. They're way out in left field in 10 years from now. When the standard of music is lowered, then the standard of dress, then the standard of conduct. And God ain't within a million miles of it. Amen. So what are we supposed to do, preacher? You know what I'd say do? I'd say thank God that you got a Bible. Amen. Thank God you got a church that's trying to do right. Amen. Pray for the other churches that are trying to do right. Amen. Try to teach people that may be in a fog or don't know any better. Right. You're, we're no better than nobody, right. anybody. We're trying to help people. And that's what I hope this is. You know what we need to do as a church at Southridge? We need to get on the altar. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot bigger than us that's fell. Amen. And we're, we're no exception to the game. There's men a whole lot greater than me and the men and, and families in here that have went down an awful road when it comes to their churches. We need to be on the altar thanking God for what we got and begging God to help us, give us wisdom, and, and not be in the dark about what's going on in these last days. That when the Lord comes, we hadn't fell away. Heads bowed and eyes are closed.